Chapter Eight of Child Life in Colonial Days by Alice Morse Earl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Diaries and Commonplace Books, and such his judgment, so exact his text as what was best in books as what books best that had he joined those notes his labours took from each most praised and praised deserving book and could the world of that choice treasure boast it need not care though all the rest were lost and such his wit he writ past what he quotes and his productions far exceed his notes eglog on the death of ben jonson lucius carey lord falkland sixteen thirty seven grown folk had in colonial days a habit of keeping diaries and making notes in interleaved almanacs but they are not of great value to the historian for they are not what wadsworth declared such compositions should be namely abundant in observation and sparing of reflection they are instead barren of accounts of happenings and descriptions of surroundings and are chiefly devoted to weather reports and moral and religious reflections both original and in the form of sermon and lecture notes the note-taking habit of puritan women was held up by such detractors as bishop earl as one of their most contemptible traits to-day we can simply deplore it as having been such a vain thing for it is certainly true no matter how deeply religious in feeling any one of the present day may be that to the modern mind a long course of pious sentiments and religious aspiration of others is desperately tiresome reading such records were not tiresome however to those of puritan faith there were but few old-time diaries which were not composed on those lines the chief exception is that historical treasure house judge sewell's diary which shows plainly also the deep religious feeling of its author another of more restricted interest but of value is that of dr parkman the westborough minister governor winthrop's history has much of the diary element in it naturally the diaries of children copied in quality and wording those of their elders a unique exception is those youthful records in the journal of a year or two of the life of a boston schoolgirl anna green winslow fortunately little anna's desire to report the sermons she had heard at the old south church and to moralize in ambitious theological comments thereon was checked by the sensible aunt with whom she lived who said a miss of twelve years can possibly do justice to nice subjects in divinity and therefore had better not attempt a repetition of particulars we therefore have a story of her life not of her thoughts and many references to her diary appear in this volume 
it is curious and interesting to note how puritan traits and habits lingered in generation after generation and outlived change of environment and mode of living in sixteen thirty rev john white of dorchester england brought out a puritan colony which settled in massachusetts and named the village dorchester after their english home in sixteen ninety five a group of the descendants of these settlers once more immigrated to carolina tradition asserts that they were horrified at the persecution of witches in massachusetts Upham names one Daniel Andrew as a man who protested so vigorously against the prevailing folly and persecution that he was compelled to fly to South Carolina. Thomas Staples was fearless enough to sue and obtain judgment against the deputy governor for saying Goodwife Staples was a witch and members of his family went also to south carolina with loyalty to their two dorchester homes a third dorchester in south carolina was named they built a good church which is still standing though the village has entirely disappeared and the site is overgrown with large trees Indian wars, poor government, church oppression, and malaria once more drove forth these undaunted Puritans to found a fourth Dorchester in Georgia. In 1752 they left in a body, took up a grant of 22,000 acres in St. John's Parish, and formed the Midway Church their meeting-house was headquarters for the whigs during the revolution was burned by the british rebuilt in seventeen ninety and is still standing in it meetings are held every spring by hundreds of the descendants of its early members though it is remote from railroads and swamps and pine barrens have taken the place of smiling rice and cotton fields stories of the rigidity of church government of these people still exist the tradition of one child who smiled in midway church was for generations held up with horror as though she had hoofs and horns there attended this church a descendant of both andrew and staples the scoffers at witches one mary osgood sumner she had a short and sad life married at eighteen she was widow at twenty and with her sister mrs holmes an aunt of oliver wendell holmes and another sister annie sailed from newport to new york and were never heard of more she left behind her sermon notes and a quote unquote, monitor or diary which had what she called a blacklist of her childish wrongdoings omissions of duty etc while the white list showed the duty she performed though she was evidently absolutely conscientious these are the only entries on the black leaf july eighth i left my stays on the bed july nine misplaced sister sass july ten spoke in haste to my little sister spilt the cream on the floor in the closet july twelve i left sister cynthia's frock on the bed july sixteen 
i left the brush on the chair was not diligent in learning at school july seventeen i left my fan on the bed july nineteen i got vexed because sister was a-going to cut my frock july twenty second part of this day i did not improve my time well july thirtieth i was careless and lost my needle august fifth i spilt some coffee on the table not a very heinous list here are entries from the good page of her little monitor white leaf july eighth i went and said my catechism to-day came home and wrote down the questions and answers then dressed and went to the dance endeavored to behave myself decent july eleventh i improved my time before breakfast after breakfast made some biscuits and did all my work before the sun was down july twelfth i went to meeting and paid good attention to the sermon came home and wrote down as much of it as i could remember july seventeen i did everything before breakfast endeavored to improve in school went to the funeral in the afternoon attended to what was said came home and wrote down as much as i could remember july twenty fifth a part of this day i parsed and endeavored to do well and a part of it i made some tarts and did some work and wrote a letter july twenty seventh i did everything this morning same as usual went to school and endeavored to be diligent came home and washed the butter and assisted in getting coffee july twenty eighth i endeavored to be diligent to-day in my learning went from school to sit up with the sick nursed her as well as i could july thirty i was pretty diligent at my work to-day and made a pudding for dinner august one i got some peaches for to stew after i was done washing up things and got my work and was middlin diligent august four i did everything before breakfast and after breakfast got some peaches for aunt mel then got my work and stuck pretty close to it and at night sat up with sister and nursed her as good as i could august eight i stuck pretty close to my work to-day and did all that sister gave me and after i was done i swept out the house and put the things to rights august nine i endeavored to improve my time to-day in reading and attending to what brother read and most of the evening i was singing i have given this record of this monotonous young life in detail simply to prove the simplicity of the daily round of a child's life at that time the pages prove with equal force the domination of the puritan temperament a nervous desire and intent to be good and industrious and attentive and helpful we seldom meet that temperament in children nowadays and when we do it is sure to be as in this case a puritan inheritance john quincy adams when eleven years old determined to write a journal and he thus lucidly and sensibly explains his intentions to his mother honored mamma my papa enjoins it upon me to keep a journal or diary 
of the events that happen to me and of objects i see and of characters that i converse with from day to day and although i am convinced of the utility importance and necessity of this exercise yet i have not patience and perseverance enough to do it so constantly as i ought my papa who takes a great deal of pains to put me in the right way has also advised me to preserve copies of all my letters and has given me a convenient blank book for this end and although i shall have the mortification a few years hence to read a great deal of my childish nonsense yet i shall have the pleasure and advantage of remarking the several steps by which i shall have advanced in taste judgment and knowledge a journal book and a letter book of a lad of eleven years old cannot be expected to contain much of science literature arts wisdom or wit yet it may serve to perpetuate many observations that i may make and may hereafter help me to recollect both persons and things that would other ways escape my memory my father has given me hopes of a pencil and pencil book in which i can make notes upon the spot to be transferred afterwards to my diary and my letters this will give me great pleasure both because it will be a sure means of improvement to myself and make me to be more entertaining to you i am my ever honored and revered mamma your dutiful and affectionate son john quincy adams i believe this diary so carefully decided upon does not now exist the adams family preserved a vast number of family papers but this was not among them i am sorry for i find john quincy adams a very pleasing child when he was about seven years old his father was away from home as a delegate to a congress at philadelphia which sought to secure unity of action among the rebellious colonies his patriotic mother taught her boy in their retreat at braintree to repeat daily each morning with the lord's prayer collins inspiring ode beginning how sleep the brave who sink to rest etc later in life adams wrote to a quaker friend for the space of twelve months my mother with her infant children dwelt liable every hour of the day and of the night to be butchered in cold blood or taken and carried into boston as hostages my mother lived in unintermitted danger of being consumed with them all in a conflagration kindled by a torch in the same hands which on the seventeenth of june seventeen seventy five lighted the fires of charlestown i saw with my own eyes those fires and heard britannia's thunders in the battle of bunker hill and witnessed the tears of my mother and mingled them with my own the mother took her boy by the hand and mounted a height near their home and showed him the distant signs of battle thus she fixed an impression of a war for liberty on this young memory two years later to relieve her anxious and tedious waiting for intelligence from her husband the boy became post-rider for her between braintree and boston which towns were eleven miles apart not a light or easy task for a nine-year-old boy with the unsettled roads and unsettled times 
the spirit of patriotism which filled the mind of all grown folk was everywhere reflected in the minds of the children josiah quincy was at school in andover from seventeen seventy eight to seventeen eighty six and he stated that he and his schoolmates had as a principle as a schoolboy law that every hoop sled etc should in some way bear thirteen marks this was evidence of the good political character of the owner and if the marks were wanting the article was contraband was seized and forfeited without judge jury or power of appeal besides journal-keeping folks of that day had a useful custom of keeping a commonplace book that is they wrote out in a blank book memorable sentences or words which attracted their attention or admiration in the various books they read or made abstracts or notes of the same cotton mather tells of such note-making by young students this writing out of aphorisms statements etc not only fixed them in the memory but kept them where the memory of faulty could easily be assisted it also served as practice in penmanship a verb too commonplace came from this use of the word the biography of francis north baron guilford gave an account which explains fully commonplacing it was his lordship's constant practice to commonplace as he read he had no bad memory but was diffident and would not trust it he acquired a very small but legible hand for where contracting is the main business of law it is not well to write as the fashion now is in uncial or semi uncial letters to look like pig's ribs his writing on his commonplaces was not by way of index but epitome because he used to say the looking over a commonplace book on any occasion gave him a sort of survey of what he had read about matters not then inquisited which refreshed them somewhat in his memory people invented methods of keeping commonplace books and gave rules and instructions in commonplacing i have seen several commonplace books made by children of colonial times pathetic memorials in every case of children who died in early youth tender and loving hearts have saved those little unfinished records of childish reading after the way of mothers and fathers till the present day whose grieved affections cannot bear the thought even of reverent destruction of the irregular writing of a dearly loved child whose hands are folded in death one of these books with scantily filled pages was tied with a number of notebooks of an old new england minister and in the father's handwriting on the first leaf were these words fifty years ago died my little john a child of promise alas alas january tenth eighteen o five the matter read by those children is clearly indicated by their commonplace books one entry shows evidence of light reading it is of riddles which are headed guesses they are the ones familiar to us all in mother goose's melodies to-day the answers are written in a most transparent juvenile shorthand thus the answer well is indicated by the figures twenty three five twelve twelve referring to the position of the letters in the alphabet the usual entries are of religious character extracts from sermon answers from the catechism verses of hymns accompany stilted religious aspirations and appeals in them a painful familiarity with and partiality for quotations bearing on 
hell and the devil show the religious teaching of the times end of chapter eight